I'm Amber Hunt, and this is Accused, the unsolved murder of Elizabeth Andes. On the last episode... He, he definitely had an agenda. He, he, he wasn't letting me out of there until I confessed to it. So the confession was factually incorrect. You see that in cases where the police run in, identify a suspect, and interrogate him into confession before they've even analyzed the crime scene. And I vividly remember Mr. Andy standing up and saying, then who killed my dog? This is the episode in which I introduce you outright to the acquaintances of Beth's who current investigators think maybe should have been questioned a little more back when she was killed in 1978. Before I start, humor me for a disclaimer of sorts. In the next two episodes, I'm going to lay out for you information and interviews with interesting people. These are not suspects. As Joseph Statham, the former Oxford chief, told us in an earlier episode, Bob Young was the only official suspect in this case. Speaking for myself, I was convinced, and I know John Halcombe, our prosecutor, was totally convinced that we had the right guy. But this disclaimer isn't just about legalities. Sometimes as a journalist, I lay out information I've uncovered in the interviews I've done, and I hope the readers will draw their own conclusions. I don't have to say that this politician is a crook or that business is shady because readers can decide that for themselves. But that's not my hope here. I don't want to inspire blog posts about how sure people are of this guy or that guy's guilt based on this show. I know it might sound cheesy and idealistic, but in this country, people really are innocent until proven guilty, and it's for a reason. This is a murder. It's serious business. No one in this case wants the wrong person accused, least of all Beth's family and Bob Young, who knows all too well what it's like. At the same time, there are leads in this case that no one followed until now, so let's get going. Today, we'll start with the maintenance man. Early on, the maintenance man piqued the interest of Beth's friends. She had complained to everyone who would listen the day that she died about this guy supposedly leaving her apartment door unlocked. As we've described in previous episodes, some of those memories include a confrontation with a man. Sue Parmalee, Bob and Beth's roommate, even testified about it on the first day of trial back in March 1979. Sue said that Beth thought the debacle warranted a full return on the rental deposit. Sue said in the trial, quote, And then she said later there was a knock on her door and another maintenance man, not the same one. She didn't know his name. He came up and gave her a bad time. He said, hey, you don't have anything on us, you know. Just cool it. If you earn your deposit back, you'll get your deposit, end quote. This conversation really bothered Sue. It bugged her so much that before the trial, she asked Assistant Prosecutor Michael Moser about it because she thought it sounded a little creepy that someone had bothered to show back up at Beth's apartment just to tell her to cool it. Sue testified, quote, I thought that's who might have killed her, end quote. Moser wasn't receptive, she told the jury. He told her not to play detective. Attorney Deb Lydon said that would have been fine if the detectives had played detective. Interestingly enough, there didn't appear to be any major interviewing of him. Uh, the, nobody looked at his personnel file. Nobody looked at anything else related to him. And within a matter of days, he left the state and moved reportedly to Las Vegas. Leiden, if you remember, is the lawyer who's been working for free with Beth's family. There was another reason Beth's friends wondered about the maintenance man. During trial, the defense pointed out that Beth's wallet was missing from her apartment after she died. She'd just been given this new leather billfold with a matching cigarette case from Bob's family at Christmas. Investigators found Beth's old, empty wallet in her room, but the new wallet, which was thought to have about 40 bucks in it, was never recovered. Matt Crehan told jurors that maybe this murder had started as a robbery. And he pointed out that all maintenance men at Candlewood Terrace had easy access to keys for every single apartment. Police reports indicate that even past staff members might have copies of keys. So Beth's friends thought, well, isn't that worth exploring? 
Steve Green had bounced around the country after 1978, working one repairman job or another. He'd been charged a couple of times for drug and theft crimes, which caught my interest, not only because of the missing wallet, but because there'd been a string of thefts at Candlewood Apartments in the weeks before Beth's murder. As Oxford Police Lieutenant Jeff Robinson had told me, Green did sometimes make it back to Ohio. I showed up one night at an address that I found associated with his name, and the person living there gave me Green's cell phone number. Hi, how are you? I'm Amber. I'm a reporter with the Inquirer. I know it's weird to have somebody just call the report. So we were trying to... I, I got his number. Oh, you do? Really? Yeah, okay. great. He was even in Ohio the first time I called him out of the blue. He had no warning that I was trying to reach him or what I was calling about. I am putting together a story that takes a look at a 1978 case, um, and I'm, I'm piecing together bits of it, and I ran across your name in a file, so I was reaching out to you because I'm, I'm trying to tell the story as properly as possible, and I was hoping that I could jog your memory and see what you remembered. 1978 case. Yes. That would probably be the girl that got killed in Oxford. That, that would be the one. That's Which interesting, is- yes. Like so many players in this case, he remembered a surprising amount off the top of his head. I sensed he might have been a little suspicious about my reason for calling, but if he was, he at least seemed willing to answer my questions. Here's his initial memory of what happened. I was a maintenance engineer, electrician at the Candlewood Terrace apartment complex. I was living there at the time, and I was in the process of getting ready to go to Las Vegas. I uh, was invited by my brother to come out to babysit his son. He was a military officer in the midst of a divorce. My producer, Amanda, and I did find court documentation of this divorce recorded in March 1979. So, uh, one of the last days I was working there, I was sent to this apartment to repair, if I remember correctly, a light above the sink that was not functioning. And I got my key and I went in and I found the problem. I fixed it. When I left, I locked the door behind me. I'm sure I did all that because I always did. It's a matter of habit. I double-checked myself. I didn't go into any other rooms. I was in Vegas. Uh, I got there just after Christmas because we left at Christmas time, and the Oxford Police Department wanted to know why I had left the area. And I gave them the reasons, and I told them my brother's name and everything, and then they explained to me that a girl had died uh, that... uh, They considered her boyfriend to be the primary suspect, if I remember correctly. And that they had found her, I guess, in a dumpster. I don't know about this. Um, I just went into the place. I checked it, uh, the light, and fixed it and walked out. I didn't go into any other rooms. That's not my business. And so I can't help you much more than that, other than the person who just happened to be there. I caught on the fact that Green mentioned locking the door before I brought up Beth's complaints about her door being unlocked. So I asked him about it. I I, came, I kind of remember hearing something like that in the background of my memory because yeah. I think I had to defend myself at the time. And I do remember myself saying, I always lock the doors. Because yeah. I do. And, and that's why my memory is so acute on it. Uh, it's one of the few things that actually do pop out other than this phone call I get telling me that this girl was murdered in her apartment that I was into just previous to her death. Do you remember the the woman at all? As in, I never met her. Never seeing her around? Never met her. I, I wouldn't be able to identify her picture. I didn't know if she's even black or white, but most students at Oxford were white. You didn't um you didn't talk to her about her being upset about her door being left unlocked? I did not know. If somebody said that, it might have been uh, one of the maintenance people at the office. Uh, remember, I was just a low-level hierarchy. Uh, if they ever contacted anybody, they went to the main office, this receptionist there, and the person who was actually my nominal supervisor. Green's memory today sounds pretty impressive, and a lot of what he says matches up with the investigative files, but not everything. For example... He said a few times that he remembered Beth's body having been found in a dumpster. 
I never corrected him on this because I didn't want to taint his memories in case a police investigator decided to chat with him after I did. He also remembered having successfully fixed the light in Beth's kitchen, but photos taken of her apartment after her death show that light above the kitchen sink was still dismantled. And Green made a point to say to me that he didn't go into other rooms, but a handwritten statement he made the day after Beth's murder indicates that he did poke his head into the bedrooms to see if anyone was home. No one was, he told police back then. The most concerning discrepancy for me was his memory of the timeline. He initially thought he learned of the murder after he moved to Las Vegas in very early January 1979, but that is impossible. He had to have still been in Oxford when he was first told because he gave a handwritten statement on police department letterhead. Another notation in the files includes his forwarding address, and it says he moved on January 3rd. But maybe it's unfair to worry about these discrepancies. You can't expect flawless memories from four decades ago, right? Green was polite on his first phone call with me. He even offered to chat again in person. He said Amanda and I could video and audio record the meeting. He was quite forthcoming, especially when I mentioned that the case was still unsolved. He didn't get, he didn't get yeah. convicted? No, he was... I did not know that. Yeah. I thought it was a closed case. My gosh. Yeah. Oh, my. Now, now I'm concerned. Uh, oh, that's terrible. I'll be more than happy to do what you need. Do you want me to meet you here in Oxford or all three of the above? I took this duty seriously. I knew, of course, that police hadn't yet tracked Green down, and I didn't want to learn after my interview that my questions had somehow tainted an investigation, even if it had been stalled before my involvement. I've just never considered it my job to screw up a police case if I can help it. So I reached out to a forensic interrogator and cold case investigator named Jen Lebo, whom I met almost a decade ago on a case I covered in Michigan. Because she works regularly with police, she's asked not to be recorded for this broadcast, and you won't hear much about her anyway. But I did want to be transparent about her role in helping me prepare for my in-person interview with Stephen Green. The goal was to chat with him by asking him questions that trained police investigators are taught to ask. Lebo sent me six pages of example questions. The tips were things like, don't mention police or use the word victim. That kind of language could have someone thinking about crimes and penalties and courtrooms, which could scare them away from telling the truth. I was advised to avoid correcting faulty memories, like that comment about the dumpster. When we met, Green told me that some of his friends had advised him against the interview. No good can come from it, they said. They might be trying to trap you. I suppose that's subjective. I just wanted the truth, of course, but I'd have been a fool not to wonder if I was meeting with someone who maybe had a reason for not wanting to be truthful. At that point, Green even whipped out his own cell phone to record our conversation, so there's documentation on both sides of this discussion. Green insisted his aim was to be honest. That's one reason why the trepidation over this interview came up. However, I always felt an open policy is always best. And I've tried to uh, answer everything as clean as I can. Uh, not just truthfully, but uh, openly, so you can ask more questions. Um, as for defending myself, uh, who wouldn't? You know, gee, many Christmas, a girl got killed. That's no small thing. I mean... Any kind of attack is bad, all right? But usually when the person survives, they can go, that guy did it. In this case, she can't speak for herself. And, and that's the real tragedy here. That girl would be in her 60s, right? Or no, she would be in her late 50s right now. After what? Wonderful, productive life with a whole generations of people following behind and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, maybe, who knows? Lebo told me to ask Green what the penalty should be for whoever did this to Beth. She said his answer might be illuminating. Here's how Green responded, though. Please excuse the hammering noise in the background. What should happen to them? Well, after you uh, disembowel them and hang them by their own innard. You see, I, I detest murder. I detest rape. I don't know if rape occurred. But those two right there, and child abuse, sorry about that. <laughs> but, but 
Uh, no, I'm a construction person. I apologize for all the noise. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, those three in particular, I think uh, get rid of them. I, I am a firm proponent of the death penalty. The reason? Why should we waste our resources keeping something like that alive? And that's my opinion. That answer was probably a little less incriminating than someone who'd argued for leniency. I specifically had been advised not to ask whether Green had killed Beth Andes. But you know how sometimes there's a question in the air and if you don't ask it, it will actually draw more attention to it than if you did ask it? Yeah, that's what happened here. So I tackled the elephant in the room. I suppose I should ask bluntly for the cameras. Did you have anything to do with what happened to this girl? You know, I was expecting that question. Let me answer truthfully. No. I have absolutely nothing to do with it. I have no way of proving such a thing, but I have no way of uh, denying the fact that I had nothing to do with it. I, I, except for the fact that I was in that apartment. Now, it's scary to think how close you come to such an atmosphere. But, uh, no, I didn't do a darn thing. I didn't hurt no girl. I didn't. Have you ever hurt anyone? No, I don't hurt people. I don't hurt people. Have you ever had any run-ins with the law? <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I, I, I covered crime in Detroit It's a world of years. public record, my dear. <laughs> you can look me up. He told me about some drug arrests. He highlighted one in particular in Vegas. You ever watch cops, he asks. Sure, I said. He said the jump out boys had nearly paralyzed him. And with his right hand, he lifted his left hand up to show me. It was contorted into a claw. There was a sunken depression between his thumb and his index finger, like a balloon had been deflated in his hand. He called it hollow. He'd been arrested in a drug sting, he explained, and left to sit in handcuffs that were too tight for seven and a half hours. He described several surgeries he's endured to fix his hand and to keep him from walking stiff-legged, as if Frankenstein and the mummy had a kid together. Those are his words. But he said there is a silver lining to the ordeal. It got him off of drugs. So you remember the so-called addict letter sent to Bob Young's lawyer after the trial started? The writer had claimed responsibility for killing Beth because he needed a fix. I asked Green if he'd been using drugs back in his Candlewood days. Sure, he said, mostly weed. He tried cocaine, but it was too expensive for a guy making his salary. You gotta remember something about being a child of the 70s, all right? Like, you either did drugs or you were a narc. I still don't know if the attic letter is a red herring or not. The defense theory about Beth's murder having been motivated by robbery had been in the newspapers before the letter showed up at Matthew Crehan's office. So it could have been written by anyone wanting to cast doubt on Bob as the suspect, or it could have been written by the killer if maybe he felt remorseful or at least didn't want an innocent man to go down for his crime. Whatever the case, it doesn't seem likely that Steve Green wrote it, if only because of the postmark. It was stamped in Dayton in March 1979, three months after Green had made his new home in Vegas. Police did catch up with Green before he left the state, and he told them he had an alibi for the night that Beth died. He said he and another maintenance worker named Al Gerard had gone to the movies together. This made me wonder. Here were two maintenance workers who provided each other's alibis. So I tracked down Gerard to hear his version of things. He and Green aren't friends anymore. In fact, Steve Green didn't seem to recognize his name when I mentioned it. But Gerard did remember going to the movies to see an animated version of Lord of the Rings. That's not all he remembers. It was terrible. I mean, <laughs> it's not like looking at old Bugs Bunny cartoon or a computer-rated uh, cartoon of today. It was sort of like in the middle between those two. Do you remember, did you guys back. walk out talking about how bad it was? Uh... Yeah, we go, boy, that was really bad. Whose idea was this, anyway? Okay. I I looked at Steve. I go, you, your idea. So, (laughs) that's the movie I saw. 
Gerard remembers getting a burger after the movie, and by his recollection, he and Steve were back at their respective homes about 10.45 or 11 p.m. The only thing that felt kind of fishy to him in hindsight was the fact that they'd gone to the movies at all. He said he didn't know Green very well, and he remembered being surprised when he was invited to the movies. That's probably what prompted Gerard to call me back the day after we talked. He said he was starting to worry about being a virtual stranger's alibi. I'm not saying he did it. I have no clue who. But maybe we caught the second show. You're saying if I'm the only alibi, (laughs) I'd I'd rather you you check the time, is what you're saying, right? Well, yeah, I'm shooting myself in the butt at the same time. If the movie didn't start until later. Right, okay. Those are really whiny uh, co workers, or you got kids. No, I have, I'm off today, and uh, <laughs> I do have, right. you would be, no, you would be surprised how whiny co workers can be, but no, this is my two year old. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I'm not blaming anybody because I wouldn't know. Right. And at the same time, if it was a later movie, uh, like I say, I'm shooting myself in the butt also. As in because it's your alibi? Well, it is my alibi. I was at the movie with Steve Green, but maybe it was a later show. Do I need to worry about you too? (laughs) That's why I said shoot myself in the butt. (laughs) Okay, gotcha. But I hear you. (laughs) Uh, heck no. Amanda found an old newspaper clip advertising the times for the Lord of the Rings at the Hamilton County Theater Gerard remembered going to. The times were 7.30 p.m. and 9.55 p.m. If Gerard's right about the time he got home, that would mean they went to the 7.30 showing, which meant that they had to leave by 7 p.m. Beth Andy's body was still warm when police arrived just after 9.30 p.m. I asked Gerard... But you know that Uh he was at the movies with you? Yeah, he drove. He drove, okay. But did he sit with you in the theater? Yeah, we sat in the theater and watched it, and after that we went got uh, burgers at some burger place. Okay, let's get back to Stephen Green. I asked Green if I could pass along his contact info to Oxford Police. Right, and obviously they've tried to reach you, but they haven't been successful. Do you mind if I give them... Oh, cool. Boom. Boom. Right now. Well, I don't need to do it right now. Well, you know what I mean. No, I mean, no, I'm saying right now. Yes, please do. I will be more than happy to give any information that's available to me. I'll go under a hypnoregression. I'll go under a lie detector. I don't care. Anything to help solve this would be something I want to do. More than that, I would feel gratified if it helped. Uh, even to clear up some missing problems or to eliminate others. So what does this mean? I admit I'm not sure. He insists he didn't do it, which of course means nothing unless you believe that the real world is like a Bones episode and the guilty party always confesses when confronted. But let's say he's telling the truth. That thought actually frustrates me because if police had bothered to interview him properly in 1978, maybe his memory would have been fresher. Maybe his statements would have helped lead to Beth's killer. After I interviewed Green, I sent him his handwritten statement. I didn't beforehand because I wanted unrehearsed responses. I wanted to see what he genuinely remembered. After he saw what he wrote in 78, he said some things he was certain about didn't seem so concrete anymore. Yeah, I uh, can't remember uh, 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 accurately enough to be of any use to you because obviously that statement is mine. That is my handwriting. What I'm trying to say is, I didn't even remember I'd been into the apartments multiple times uh, or what work was required besides that one light. I remember a light. Uh, But I I didn't even know I'd met the girl. Uh, Apparently I had, at least I think I said as much. Uh, Either way, jeez, my memory and the uh, statement don't jive close enough to be of any use to you. Here's what's in a statement that he didn't remember during our interview. He said that he had stuck his head into other rooms and noticed that things were boxed up, 
though he told me he was sure he didn't go into other rooms. He also wrote that he'd been there several times in the days before Beth's murder, not just once. He told police he knew who she was, but today he says he has no memory of meeting her. In his statement, he spent a couple of sentences describing how Beth wanted to get her deposit back, that she had sort of been using the supposedly unlocked door to argue for a full refund. This always struck me as a little callous to highlight in the wake of her death. Steve Green noticed that too and offered an explanation. The reason I would have said something like that is because I think that was kind of an angling in the back of my mind for her trying to get money back. Okay, so uh, that maybe you didn't believe that the door was like left unlocked? I was positive it wasn't. At that point, you can see it written right there. Uh, because like I said, I have this thing about double checking myself. That doesn't mean I always do it. That doesn't mean I could not have left it unlocked. It just means that I was fairly certain at the time I didn't. Okay. You were, you're suspecting that you were certain at the time that you felt she was angling for a way to get her money back. So mm. you just didn't take it as, as a serious concern. I may, might have written that down in that phrase to try to justify my certainty. You know, I don't know what my mindset was at the time. Sure. It wasn't to be worried about this girl getting killed or for me to fall under suspicions just to try to help the police. And for me to say something like the girl was trying to get her deposit back and to put that in the statement means to me it, it signified something a little bit off. Now, I don't know uh, how you can prove a negative. Uh, you can't prove that you didn't do something. So, and especially 37 years later. Green and I talked about how memory is a funny thing. This was his bottom line. It's so fragmented now that uh, after reading that statement, I can't trust a single thing that I think. The maintenance man has always been a question mark for best friends and family, but he hasn't been at the foreground of Deb Lydon's suspicions. Her most damning thoughts center on a man whom Beth isn't thought to have ever met in her life. His name was Boyd Glasscock. He was 30 years old when Beth died. Glasscock knew Bob Young because the two men had worked together in the summers painting houses. Boyd would never have been linked at all to Beth Andy's case if he hadn't inserted himself into it. Because he did, he was questioned at the time by a police officer who went so far as to request Glasscock's fingerprints from a previous arrest to put in the case file. Strangely, only prints from one hand ever seem to have been located, but they're in the file anyway. Police also requested from Boyd an alibi, not because they thought he needed one, they believed Bob Young was guilty after all, but because Bob's lawyer was pretty insistent that they look at this peripheral guy. Here's Leiden explaining what it was about Boyd that piqued her interest. And then there's indication that when Bob Young was indicted, that um, Boyd Glasscock kind of went nuts and started visiting Bob Young's house, started going to Bob Young's place of employment, went to the place where Bob Young knocked on the door to call 911 or call the police about the stabbing, about the murder. Um, you know, and he had gone other places, and he had told Bob Young eventually that he had actually even seen Bob at his place of employment, which led me to believe that he may have followed Bob to where Bob lived, so he knew where Bob and Beth lived. In any case, um, he uh, apparently showed up at Bob Young's house, I believe, on January 5th, so just uh, about seven or eight days after the murder and um, came at a time when the Youngs were not home. Bob was not home. He left a note of some sort. Um, nobody's seen that note or, or you know, has, seems to have any evidence of that note existing still. But anyway, came back at 1.30 in the morning to the Youngs family house, asked if he could see Bob then. The parents said, no, come back another time. He came back the following day at 3.30. Um, and, and then proceeded to have a very strange interaction with Bob Young, um, where he tried to say he had theories about who murdered Beth. Leiden looked long and hard at Boyd Glasscock. She learned he had died in 1995 of a drug overdose. And she'd called to ask one of his sisters just how solid that alibi was that he'd given to police so many years ago. 
I also reached one of Boyd's relatives. I wanted to talk to people who knew him. A family member agreed to speak to me and on the record, but she asked me not to publish her name. I thought at first it was because of the stigma attached to mental illness. She corrected me. No, that's not it. You're looking into him because his name is connected to a murder case. That's a far worse stigma. Yeah, I felt a little stupid after that. I promised this relative, let's call her Bonnie, that I would be blunt and honest. So in that first phone conversation, I told her why I was calling about Boyd. This name keeps coming up um, because there are some uh, investigators hired by the family who think that he makes the most sense. Ah, <gasps> you're kidding! I hate telling you that. I'm. I can't even share that with my husband. In a later phone call after the shock had subsided, Bonnie said she checked around with other family members and was certain that Glasscock's alibi was sound. She was almost apologetic about it. I hate to tell you this, but they were certain there was no involvement at all. In fact, he had a um, um, an alibi for where he was, which wasn't close to Cincinnati. Okay, and that seemed. And why? Why did you say you hate to tell me that? I mean, that seems like it would be. A good oh thing no! To... Oh, it is. It's everything for me. Yes. Okay. But because I, I'm you're not, doing, I'm not hoping for him to. <laughs> no, no, I know, but you're looking into it, I'm so. Looking for an answer, I see what you're saying. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. That's actually very thoughtful of you. <laughs> Thank you. But Leiden's interest in Boyd goes beyond Beth Andy's. This is where the case starts to get a little twisted. See, there are other unsolved murders in central Ohio. One was in Boyd's hometown of Kettering, a Dayton suburb. It was written about in a book called The Girl on the Volkswagen Floor, which was later made into a movie called Man on a Swing, starring Cliff Robertson and Joel Grey. Because of the use of things at hand, such as the blanket, etc., compulsive to because of the very careful arrangement of things. That sound from the movie. I also read the book, which was written in 1971 by a Dayton journalist named William Arthur Clark. It chronicles the investigation into the strange murder of a young teacher named Barbara Ann Butler. Barbara went shopping one day in 1968 at a discount store. She disappeared from the store parking lot and was found 25 hours later covered by a folded blanket on the floor of her own Volkswagen car, which was still parked in the store parking lot. She had been strangled like Beth, though the ligature markings only went around the sides of her neck. The key to her car was found beneath her body. Her arms had at some point been bound, police deduced, because they found tape residue on them, but it didn't appear she'd been raped. The case baffled investigators so much that when a supposed clairvoyant called to offer his services, they didn't balk. They listened. The clairvoyant is identified in the book by the pseudonym Norman Dodd, but in real life, that supposed psychic was Bill Boshears. Boshears would later go on to write columns for the Inquirer called ESP and You. In the book account of the Butler case, the psychic did seem to have some interesting insight. He knew that the prescription for her glasses was just for one eye. He described fairly well what police believed happened, and he predicted a second murder would be committed soon, and it was. This time, 12-year-old Regina Dishnowski was kidnapped from her yard in Kettering. She was strangled, and a man named Jimmy Wayne Howard was convicted. Barbara Ann Butler's case isn't considered unsolved because police believe that Howard killed her too, even though he was never tried for it. Something in this case interested Deb Lydon, especially when she learned Boyd Glasscock's employment history. She found that in 1968, he worked in the building next door to the discount store from which Barbara disappeared. It, of course, could be coincidence, and so could the timing of Glasscock's only arrest record that we could find. That was three weeks before Beth's murder. The police report says that Boyd was acting bizarre at the school where he worked as a substitute teacher. He was being disruptive and belligerent and refused to leave. Police arrested him and charged him with trespassing. I can see no adjudication of that case beyond. 
On paper, it's clear that Boyd has issues, but mental illness does not a killer make. His family, member we're calling Bonnie, has been incredibly gracious to me as I've talked with her time and again about Boyd. She described his childhood for me, how there's an age gap between some of his five siblings, and that Boyd was closer to some of them than with others. Anyway, so there were, I mean, he he was brilliant. He went to uh, first to Wright State, and I think he may have gone to UC, and he went to the University of Chicago, and, you know, and got degrees. He was a very learned man and well-traveled, etc., but... He just, you know, things became more bizarre the older he got. But now, remember, that was not in the 70s at all. That was later. He was born in 48, so he was still a young person at that time. Right. Now, I've covered some bizarre cases, but I have to say I've never quite been in this position. By the time I'm talking to this relative, I know more about Boyd Glasscock than I do about some of my own family members. I've got his death certificate. I've read personnel records in which employers say he was a bit condescending and impatient. I know about the little scars on his arms noted by the coroner when he died. And I know that Deb Lydon has wondered whether those scars could have come from a woman fighting for her life in a fatal attack. I almost wish I could identify Boyd's relative, if only to thank her for being so understanding because I asked her questions like this. Is there, and and please know that I know how horrible this question is, and I don't mean to be insensitive. I just want to, like I said, I'm trying to be blunt here. Is there any chance that he he was involved in a murder in 1978? God, no. That's what I said. I mean, if you would ask anyone in of all of us, you know, or anyone that knew him, he was such a gentle soul. She sounded so certain. It was at such odds with what I'd been hearing about Boyd Glasscock. I had Deb Lydon in one ear saying things like, I think there's a a lot of evidence that he was psychotic. And I have suspicions that not only was he involved in this murder, but that he may have been involved in many other um, violent crimes. Leiden notes that Boyd still lived near Dayton in 1978, and that's the location printed on the so-called attic letter. She wonders, did Boyd send the letter? Her suspicions are only bolstered by that visit Glasscock made to Bob's house soon after his arrest. He not only announced he had theories about Beth's murder, but he brought with him a strange gift for Bob. And uh, he brought me a pin cushion that was... Uh, Basically, it looked like it had been stained with blood on it. And it just had this red stuff sort of all over it. And he gave it to him. I said, what is this? You know, and I just get it back. I told him to leave. He didn't want to leave, you know. That's Bob describing the gift. A pin cushion for a man whose fashion-loving girlfriend had just been murdered with a pair of sewing shears. Leiden finds that beyond bizarre. She finds it damning. She wonders if the pincushion was actually from Beth's own sewing kit. Was it Beth's blood that stained it? Bob never looked at it that way. He opened the gift, couldn't make sense of it, and shoved it back into Glasscock's hands and then asked him to leave. And so I ended up getting my dad. I said, Dad, you need to get him, get him out of here. And he said, you got to leave because I'm calling the cops. And... Uh, and he ended up leaving, and, you know, I, I wrote all this down in the letter and gave it to, to Matt. And, uh, but he was just very bizarre, and he, but he thought that I had feelings for him, and I said, you know, whatever made you think that? And he said, well, you, one day we were going to the A&W root beer thing, and he, he said, uh, I said, you buy today and I'll treat tomorrow. And for some reason, that was what, in his brains, what he told me, thought he, that I had some sort of feelings for him, which were bizarre because I never uh, thought anything. I, first, I didn't know that he was gay at the time, and then I never had any feelings like that for him at all. So that was just very, very bizarre. And I, you know, and Debbie's the one that kind of put that pincushion thing together, which I never really... You know, I I thought he was kind of a harmless guy. Leiden can't help but think that maybe, just maybe, 
Of course, she has other reasons, too. Next time on Accused. Well, I guess he was somebody that rose to my suspicion because I thought he, I thought he liked Beth. I mean, I think he wanted more from her. This is a special project from the Cincinnati Enquirer, narrated by Amber Hunt, produced by Amanda Rossman, edited by Amy Wilson, and engineered by Stephen Baum at Cincinnati Public Radio. Music was composed by Andrew Higley. To look at case documents, photos, videos, and more, visit Cincinnati.com backslash accused podcast.